Okay, let's get started. Um, thanks for coming to a press conference at FCCJ. Uh, my name is uh, Tetsuo Jimbo. Um, I am uh, I am your moderator today, and uh, um, we have um, two uh, distinguished speakers uh, today on the nuclear issue, and uh, I think it's uh, turned out to be turned, turned out to be very timely topic now that the Japan has uh, crossed a major threshold on its uh, security policy today. Abe is going to speak. Prime Minister Abe is going to speak today later in, in the day uh, in a press conference. Um, but uh, this issue has uh, something to do with the uh, stockpiling of uh, plutonium uh, by Japan. And uh, there's a uh, reprocess processing plant is now under construction. Actually, it's been under construction for a long time. I think it started in 1993. So uh, they are building this one uh, for a good 20 years now. But uh, uh, it is now expected to uh, be operational um, in this coming October. Uh, I don't know if it's really going to happen because I heard the same story over and over again, and then there's some minor accidents, and uh, uh, it's been pro you know uh, prolonged or uh, delayed a number of times. But anyway, uh, this processing reprocess reprocessing plant uh, it's now scheduled to be ready uh, in October. And uh, as you know, Japan already has uh, 60, uh, 45 tons of uh, uh, the plutonium stockpiled, and uh, uh, it's worth uh, about 5,000 uh, air bombs. And Prime Minister Abe has pledged at the Hague um, Nuclear Security Summit that it will reduce the, uh, the pluton uh, plutonium stockpile. So how does it match this, with this uh, coming of new plant? And those two uh, speakers today have an uh, uh, idea what Japan should do. And in fact, they have uh, presented their proposal to, uh, uh, to the government, uh, METI and the foreign minister, uh, ministry, and uh, addressed to Prime Minister Abe as well. So let's see if uh, Prime Minister uh, gets the message. But anyway. Um, and we will have, uh, uh, first First of all, we will have uh, uh, Professor uh, Frank von Hippel of uh, Princeton University uh, speak. And then uh, we have uh, Klaus uh, Jumberg, uh, uh, the nuclear consultant, uh, will follow. And each will speak about 15 minutes or so. Uh, so it will make uh, 30, 30 minutes. And then uh, we take questions from the floor for the re uh, remaining 30 minutes. And we were. Uh, told that we have to leave this premise at four o'clock sharp because there's some event coming uh, following this. So uh, please uh, I, uh, ask for corporations uh, to get it get it done by four. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor uh, uh, von Hippel, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is this on? Is, yeah. Okay. It's on. Thank you. Uh, we're actually here on the way to. Uh, Seoul tomorrow, uh, where we've been invited by the government to give our views on spent fuel management, and uh, we were we we're going to argue that reprocessing is not a good idea, even though uh, South Korea insists that it should have the same rights as Japan to reprocess. Uh, but we thought we would uh, stop here and, and um, take the opportunity to to uh, uh, communicate our views on on. Uh, this question about uh, what Japan would do if it were serious about minimizing its plutonium, uh, separated plutonium. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, statement that uh, Prime Minister Abe made in March in uh, The Hague in, uh, uh, at the Nuclear Security Summit, which in, where there were leaders from 60 countries about said that we will firmly maintain our policy that we will possess <clears throat> no plutonium reserves without specified purposes. But in fact, uh, this, this does not um, mean much more than Japan has a plan uh, for what it will do ultimately uh, not, uh, f with whatever plutonium is separated. Uh, <clears throat> this is the, uh, a graph which shows the uh, Japan's plutonium stockpile with time. Uh, the uh, plan which was made in 1997 was that Japan would have 
by 2010, 16 to 18 uh, nuclear react power reactors uh, using plutonium fuel and consuming this fuel. But it, it didn't happen. Uh, the little green line on the bottom shows that uh, Japan only was, it has 45 tons separately, separated now, but it has only been able to use two tons as fuel. And then uh, further out, you can see if uh, Rokasha begins operation in, uh, in 2015, then, uh, then the, the, this, this will increase. Other countries have found uh, having large plutonium stockpiles a problem. Uh, the UK right now um, you know, had a similar policy of, of uh, separating plutonium without a clear plan for what to do with it and is now faced with a, uh, the, the problem of what to do with 100 tons of separated plutonium, even more than Japan. The US is, is also uh, struggling right now uh, with what to do with 34 tons of plutonium, which became excess as a result of the reductions of its nuclear weapons stockpile uh, since the end of the Cold War. So it, it's not just uh, Japan uh, that you know we're uh, by the way, uh, the UK, the US, of course, did decide in 1977 not to do commercial reprocessing because it concluded at that time that it was not economic uh, and uh, there was no need for the plutonium. Uh, and the US, ever since then, has been saying to other countries, we don't reprocess, you don't need to either. And that has worked uh, pretty well. Uh, the uh, number of countries reprocessing has actually decreased. Uh, Japan is the last non-weapon state that uh, reprocesses. Uh, and the UK has just recently decided to stop reprocessing as well. So, uh, and there's a debate now in France. So, so, uh, so th this is in the context of the larger situation. Uh, now, uh, the with regard to Japan's use of plutonium, I showed that uh, the, the, uh, uh, it's only so far been able to use two tons. Uh, 34 tons of Japan's 45 tons are actually in Europe. They were, they were separated there in the UK and France. And the France sent back about five tons in the form of plutonium, so-called mixed oxide fuel, MOX fuel, and, uh, but only two tons so far of that five tons has been loaded in reactors and irradiated. Uh, the, with regard to Japan's own plutonium separation at Rokasho, uh, at the moment Japan has no capability of making that into fuel. There is a uh, plant under construction. Its, it's um, uh, completion date is, has been slipping. It's currently, talk they're talking about 2017. Uh, so there would be, for at least some time, um, a, uh, uh, there would be no way to use the plutonium that would be separated. There's already enough plutonium separated in Japan to start that plant up when it becomes available. We know that it, it may not work. Uh, the UK built a, a MOX fuel fabrication plant and uh, tried to make it work uh, from, for 10 years and finally uh, decided to abandon the project. The U.S. has been building a uh, MOX plant for its, for its um, excess weapons plutonium. Uh, it was supposed to be operating in, in 2007. I think now we're talking about, they're talking about 2020 or so. And, uh, and it's become so expensive <clears throat> that the Obama administration is talking about abandoning it and thinking and, tr and trying to f see what another cheaper way to dispose of its plutonium. Uh, the, so, the, uh, I mean, the, just storing spent fuel is, is costs about a tenth of what it costs to reprocess. Uh, so, so uh, what it, why is Japan doing this? Originally it was, uh, as most countries that were doing civilian reprocessing, started civilian reprocessing was to uh, acquire plutonium for breeder, to start up breeder reactors, plutonium breeder reactors, like Manju, that were, we were supposed to have thousands of them in the world by now. 
uh, but in fact, they didn't. They did not. See, it turned out that sodium-cooled reactors are much more expensive and much less reliable than water-cooled reactors, and therefore uh, uh, they didn't come. Uh, and now the argument in, in Japan is that uh, that the the pool spent fuel pools are filling up, uh, and uh, that. Uh, in, it, it's necessary to have some place to send the spent fuel to, and the Rokasho is the only place that can be it could be sent to. Uh, there is uh, TEPCO and JAPCO have built and completed in, in um, at Mutsu a um, a spent fuel storage facility, um, and which would be a much enough for their out, output of their plants for a long time, but uh, a more uh, the government of, of, of Mori Prefecture says, we're, which also hosts the, re, the Rokasho reprocessing plant, says we won't allow you to use it unless the reprocessing plant begins. So this is a political problem. Uh, what about what most, most of the rest of the country of the world has done is actually build uh, dry cast storage, spent fuel, where, where Klaus Janberg was a pioneer uh, on, on site. Uh, and uh, to when the pools are full, to take the older spent fuel uh, to to uh, and and uh, when it can be air cooled doesn't require water cooling. This is in fact Japan did build some of this uh, storage at uh, to, at Fukushima Daiichi and at Tokai uh, Daini. Uh, and the uh, no, not many people know about the spent fuel. Uh, casks at Fukushima Daiichi because nobody was worried about the safety of the, of the spent fuel. Uh, there's also uh, cask storage being built in, at Fukushima Daiichi for, to, uh, to make uh, room for the unloading of the spent fuel uh, from the pools of the, of the units number one, two, and three. This is a, a satellite image of, as of March. Uh, now, the, the dry cast storage uh, not only is an alternative to reprocessing, but it is also is safer than spent fuel uh, storage. Uh, and uh, in fact, the, uh, the chairman of the, of the uh, nu Nuclear Regulation Authority uh, said as much when he, at his first press conference, uh, but uh, that he, he proposed that after spent fuel was five years old, it be moved from the pools to dry casks. That would make the pools safer. Uh, the reason is th shown here. In Japan and the United States, uh, we both put as much spent fuel as we can into the pools. We actually make it so dense that it's about as dense as in a reactor core. And therefore, there would if you didn't put it in boxes with neutron absorbers in, in the w walls of the boxes, it would go critical. But the, if you lose the water in the pool, then there's no way for the air to get in to cool it. And, and if we removed the, um, the, uh, uh, the fuel over five years old, we could space it out and have a more open racking, as was originally designed, and it would be safer. So there's a safety argument as well. Uh, the, uh, it, the advocates, including METI, uh, argue that it's necessary to reprocess to make um, to re reduce the hazard from radioactive waste, uh, that's been looked at and rejected uh, in the United States and now in France even, uh, and in and now also the advisor the uh, to um, to METI on this subject says it's really not necessary to reprocess for radioactive waste management. Uh, so so the. Um, uh, or the, this is actually the slide that, uh, where I said that. So the situation is that there are 31 countries in the world with, uh, with nuclear power plants, of which six are currently reprocessing or custom, re customers are reprocessing. On the right-hand side are con countries that never reprocessed except for the United States, which reprocessed before 1972. In the middle are countries which uh, were customers of France, UK and Russia, uh, plus UK, which is stopping. And on the left, uh, we have France and Japan, which, which have policies of, uh, now that there's no breeder reactors, they would just recycle the plutonium back into the reactors from which it came from in MOX fuel. China uh, 
India and Russia, which still have pre-reactor development programs, and the Netherlands, which for some reason for, has, a, has, a, has a small old reactor, which it is re signed off again as a, as a customer for, it, for Fran of France. So in, in conclusion, uh, Japan's government agrees that, uh, as, as Prime Minister Abe said, that, that unnecessary separation and stockpiling of nuclear weapons materials anywhere is a threat to international security. Japan is 45 tons, 5,000 weapons, equivalents of, weapon, of separated plutonium that will be very difficult to, and costly to dispose of. Nevertheless, uh, the proposal is to begin to operate Rokashio, the reprocessing plant to separate more. The pr primary argument being that there's no other place the ship spend fuel to. Uh, but this is a problem that most other countries with nuclear power plants have solved with interim on-site and off-site storage. And that is what my colleague will discuss. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, get the microphone. No, no, I think you have to have a separate. Uh, Please, separately. I can introduce myself for the time being. Actually, uh, we, need a, we may need help here. In the meantime, I uh, can introduce myself a little further. I'm a German engineer and a French physicist. And I'm uh, generally uh, in Frank's company when he needs a technical futokurogatama. That's my role here as technical bodyguard, if you wish to say. And I want to tell you or show you uh, how the dry storage has spread all over the world. Since we started development in 76, yeah. how can you make it move? Here yeah. it is. Yeah. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the basic idea was to go via breeder and plutonium to eternal energy supply. But uh, in the 70s, we learned that it became a costly affair. Capital expenses for fast breeders were higher than for light water reactors. Reprocessing became expensive, and MOX fabrication became very expensive as well. So in Germany, we needed some, uh, some interim solution, and we chose double-purpose casks uh, by a casting process. And from the beginning, we started to design them for maximum leak tightness, full leak tightness aircraft impact resistance, and we even made sabotage tests with hollow charges to give maximum security. Meanwhile, the plutonium, which we had considered as an asset in the 60s, has lost this role and became a burden. And uh, the reprocessing facility which my utilities had started to build became too expensive. There was too much opposition, so we gave up. But here you see some realizations which we have really done on the upper left, a storage facility on the right, the inside of the storage facility met many costs, and the lower one is the famous Gorleben storage facility. But uh, I had left the German reprocessing company to continue the development of the costs, and they didn't want to pay the German utilities for big cost development, which makes this alternative economically attractive. So I had to address to customers abroad. Among these was the Department of Energy in the United States, Virginia Electric Power. But uh, there are also other solutions in other countries. For example, this is what you probably have seen already in Japanese documentation. It's from Fukushima Daiichi. It's, uh, over-designed, I would say, this uh, facility. It's, uh, um, yeah. And this is under-designed, if I may say so, in Lithuania. These are cars which we built. But I can tell you also, I'm not representing any cask manufacturer anymore. And uh, I have given my patents back for exploitation by my former company. So I can speak about any cask designer. Uh, and here on the Virginia uh, power station, we have among the castors which uh, we have designed two NAC cars from National Assurance Company. The so checks do it a little differently. On the right side, you could see how an additional earthquake fixation could look like. And uh, if you make an infrared picture of the cars, you can see that they are not very hot, but that 
in between, the stretch of hot zone is lengthened to the bottom and to the top because they shine on each other. Here in such a structure, you should also foresee that when the casks get colder and the temperatures outside change, then we have uh, sometimes condensation. Uh, and so you should reduce the air inlet. And uh, I recognize that this is another presentation. There are only a canister with the shell of tr something like 20 millimeter thickness is filled with spent fuel, and the spent fuel, the canister, is pushed into a garage. It's a completely different design, but that's about the cheapest possible. Uh, in the United States, it has not been chosen for Japan uh, for simple reasons. It does not give the same resistance as the designs which we have presented here. So unfortunately, you took the wrong one. So, oh, oh. But I could as well finish yeah. and open the round okay. back for you. Well, you uh, <laughs> okay. did your schedule. Yeah. Right. Okay, so let's go to Q&A. Um, nice please uh, uh, cite your uh, name and uh, affiliation. Uh, come forward and uh, cite your name and affiliation, and uh, let's uh, make a simple questions. Uh, start start with the uh, working press, please. Anyone from the working press? Go ahead. Yes, uh, Judith Stalpers from the Netherlands, Elsevier magazine. Um, Professor Hippel, you were here about a half a year ago, I yeah. think, with the Japanese colleague whose name has been... <laughs> <laughs> maybe... Uh, I, one year ago already? Maybe one year Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, what ha uh, has the situation in Japan uh, changed between your last visit here to Japan and right now? This is one question. And I have another question because I it went a little bit too quick about this last uh, design you showed us for a, a cask. Uh, is that applicable? The last one, you just one flipped you it away. Yeah, that uh, is that one usable for Japan or is it not usable for Japan? Um, so that's the second question. I think not. So, oh, okay. no, the Japanese have not chosen this one. It's the cheapest design possible in the United States where you don't have the same uh, environmental threats as, by example, here. See, I guess in terms of what has changed, uh, we now we have. Uh, Prime Minister Abe, we didn't have him when we were here last. Uh, and uh, so at the highest level, uh, he, he's acknowledged that there's a problem with uh, the international security associated with uh, with, with uh, having large quantities of weapons usable materials. Uh, also, but as I mentioned at the beginning, the occasion of this trip is to come to try to persuade South Korea not to do what Japan has been doing. Uh, and uh, South, South Korea has been negotiating with the US uh, uh, re to renew its agreement of cooperation uh, and has been insisting that it have the same rights as the US as were agreed uh, in 1988 uh, in the US-Japan uh, agreement of cooperation. US uh, has been resisting and uh, as a re result, the, uh, the only thing they could agree on was to extend the old agreement by two years to, and to continue to talk. Uh, so, so that, that uh, so, I mean, it, uh, the, the, uh, so the concern is not just about Japan, but also about the, con this, this example is contagious. And, and, and of course, uh, there was an upsurge. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there was an upsurge of interest in uh, South Korea in reprocessing after the, the last North Korean test. So that there's also a security, an interest in having, uh, on some a part of some people, of having a nuclear weapons option. May I add one uh, information following the question of you, Madame? Uh, in Japan, like in Germany, by example, uh, the primary choice are double purpose casks, Can a cask which are licensed for transportation and for storage. And this is also a sales argument 
very important so we can show from the beginning to the people it is not just uh, intended to stay there where we put them, but it is able to be taken away to some final location whenever this happens. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, next question. Natalie. Yeah. Uh, my name is Natalie Stuckey. I'm a freelance. Um, it was reported that the United States has been trying to persuade Japanese officials that terrorists could uh, target to attack the Rokasho plant, but uh, Japan has resisted uh, upgrading its security force, in, uh, requiring background security checks uh, for its nuclear workers. And the, I think the International Atomic Energy Agency is formally responsible for ensuring that plutonium does not leak from Rokasho plant. Um, According to you, how accurate is the system installed at, Rokasho, at the Rokasho plant, and how can uh, the various uh, international parties, and of course Japan, ensure that plutonium could not be stolen or removed from, uh, from there, uh, since it was also reported in the um, uh, weekly Friday in 2011 that uh, some, com some security companies uh, has... Uh, has ties to organized crime and uh, are v are heavily involved uh, in the nuclear industry. Thank you very much. Um, e yes, the the, uh, the the accuracy measurements ac accuracies at, at, um, of the IEA's checks of, on the plutonium flows through the uh, Rokasho plant are about one percent. Uh, so, uh, and if you have um, if it were operating at full capacity, it would separate about 8,000 8, kilograms of plutonium a year. So 1% accuracy is about 80 kilograms. And the IEA considers 8 kilograms as a weapons equivalent. So the accuracy is about 10 weapons equivalents a year. So the, the IEA recognizes that's not good enough. And so it, it has added uh, what they call containment and surveillance and containment. They try, try to uh, monitor any ways, any, any uh, doors and things like that through which the, the um, plutonium could be stolen. Uh, but that's, it, I mean, that's, if that fails, there's no way within the measurement of, and it does fail. I mean, not, I, I don't know about Rocascio, but I mean, this is, uh, it does fail. The problem with that approach is, is that there's no way to, to check within the accuracy that everything is still there. So it, reprocessing is a problem, and it's recognized as a, as a serious problem with the, for safeguards. And for that reason, even though the, the IAEA spends 20% of its safeguards budget on Rokasho and Tokaimura in globally, so it, it's huge, a hugely costly operation. And, and even so, you have the, you know, it's a difficult, uh, a very difficult, um, uh, one uh, with a, with regard to security, um, you know the, the uh, one one th thing is is um, you know the U.S. spends a lot on, of money on security of nuclear materials, about a billion dollars a year. They have lots of guards, guns, fences, and so on. I think more than any other country. But even so, uh, we have prob we have problems occurring, uh, like. Uh, about a year ago, a, an 82-year-old nun penetrated all the security, an activist nun, and uh, was, went right up to the, the, the central storage facility for U.S. highly enriched uranium. So, so the, uh, there's no perfect security. Uh, you know, some security may be more imperfect than others. Uh, the, the, most, the only perfect security is to not have the material in the first place. And so if you don't need to have the material, and in fact, we argue that nobody needs to have any material, including we should get rid of the nuclear weapons. Then you, that's the only way, really way, real definitive way to get rid of the problem. <clears throat> okay, next question. Uh, Mari Saito from Reuters. I just had a uh, quick question about final disposal. I mean, Japan's government has made very little progress. It's obviously an incredibly politically contentious discussion, um, especially after Fukushima. I mean, I understand these, uh, the idea of the cask storage and um, 
the demerits of reprocessing, but I, I was just wondering your general views on you know, the ability of the Japanese government to find its final dispo disclo um, disposal site. Right. I mean, it, it's, I mean, Klaus may, I think, let me start and then. Uh, uh, the um, final disposal, I think, is more a political problem than a technical problem. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, in my, in my view, our view, I think, uh, uh, the fuel is the most dangerous when it's in a reactor, then it becomes less dangerous when it goes into a pool, becomes even less dangerous when it goes into a cask, and becomes least dangerous when it's deep underground. So if you have a choice of where to put the, where to have it, having it deep underground is better than having it anywhere on the surface. Um, the, uh, but most people don't understand, I mean, it takes a while. And, uh, and we were just talking with a, one of the Japanese officials who's involved in this discussion, and, he's, and they expect to have a discussion to try to, to g try to get uh, with different communities to get, try to get some kind of rational uh, basis for, for uh, understanding these risks, so agreed perception of these risks. Now, in pr the countries which are furthest along on, on uh, underground disposal are Sweden and Finland. And I think it's interesting to note that the communities which host those candidate repositories are uh, already have nuclear power plants, so that they they understand, you know, that there, it's not in their interest to keep this spent fuel on the surface forever. That that it is better to put it deep underground, and so they understand the logic that I just uh, gave. And so I don't know whether uh, there are, you know, whether, whether you know, I guess I would, I would suggest to Japan to start talking with those communities, the ones that already host nuclear power plants, if they're suitable geologically. Uh, that, that might be a more prominent, I mean, based on those the statistics of two, that might be, uh, th they might have the best chance. But we have, uh, in the US, we don't, we've demonstrated that we don't have the answer. Uh, you know, by, by, uh, we tried to impose uh, a, a spent fuel repository on Nevada, and, and ultimately Nevada rejected it. And so we have to start all over again and maybe do something like what was being described to us today of a more consultative approach rather than a top-down approach. Klaus, any, any more comments? Nothing to add. Can this uh, dry cask technology be used for the final disposal? Yes. Uh, we uh, were asked by our government in Germany, I must say, to develop a cask for triple purpose, transportation, storage, and final disposal. Oh. This started in 79, and we came up with a solution in 85, which the government of that time decided or declared feasible. Mm -hmm. But with changing governments, uh, we did not make any further progress because uh, there is fierce opposition against nuclear power in Germany. It concentrated first on reprocessing the opposition, then on opening of the interim storage facilities which we had already built. And by example, I suffered perhaps most uh, because my family got threatened by uh, my daughters by defiguration, my wife uh, by murder threats, and myself too, when uh, I had to open the facility because I had always run around and I had to do the nemawashi to get uh, the people acquainted with dry storage. But uh, finally we had to come to uh, let's say consensus in 2001 to get out of reprocessing and to get out of nuclear energy by about 2021. But Fukushima destroyed even this last remainder of consensus and eight reactors were shut down immediately. So far, so good. Or not good. Okay. Anyone else? Go ahead. Uh, James Cole, University of Tsukuba in Japan. Um, 
I would like to, this question is a little bit off the track, but uh, do you think that Japan actually possesses the technology to make a nuclear weapon from this plutonium? And if so, might that explain Japan's apparent reluctance to deal with its plutonium problem? Well, I, I, I mean, the IEA assumes that um, any country uh, you know, would, that it, it decided to acquire a nuclear weapon would, would prepare the, uh, the necessary uh, system for making the, the material critical and, and before it, before it uh, diverted uh, the material. Um, but the, um, I'm sorry, what, the uh, second, second part of... Um, Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. So th this has come up uh, in in uh, in discussions in, over the past few years. Uh, you know what would happen to? I mean, some people in the security community, I think, like to have a nuclear weapons option, and they and they and they say that uh, well, what will happen to our nuclear weapons option if we? I mean, they, we don't want a nuclear weapon, but. It's nice that the world knows that we have a nuclear weapons op option. They, maybe we'll, China will push us around less. Uh, and uh, I guess the answer is you don't, I mean, I don't think that um, Japan would want 5,000 nuclear weapons. I mean, if that was the sort of Cold War craziness of the Russia and US. I mean, uh, China has maybe 200, uh, UK, France, you know the other countries have, a, so so you don't need this as much plutonium as uh, as as uh, Japan has. You don't need a huge reprocessing plant like Rokashio. You could you could say, well, you know, India's program was based on a on a on a, uh, on a, on a, a pilot plant much smaller than Tokaimura. Uh, but even so, but you wouldn't even need Tokaimura. You have a uh, you know we're talking about Iran. Iran has an enrichment program, very small, much smaller than what what um, what Japan has at Rakasho. So e even if Japan had no plutonium, it would still have a nuclear weapons option, as long as it has a uh, an enrichment plant. And of course, in enrichment plants, when they're operated the way they're intended to, they produce low enriched uranium. They don't, which is not weapons usable and is 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 therefore not a security problem. Uh, you know, we're all, we are arguing actually against national enrichment plants. Uh, in in the, we're, you know, we are involved in uh, in a, uh, advising uh, both Iran and the U.S. in, this, in these negotiations, and uh, <clears throat> we're, we, we're pointing out that the U.S. actually does not have a national enrichment plant right now. The U.S. Uh, basically shut down its Cold War. You know, the the uh, enrichment plants that were built during the Cold War. They're not economical. And the one operating enrichment plant in the United States right now is owned by Urenco. Mm -hmm. Foreign centrifuges, foreign ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are saying that maybe um, Iran also doesn't need a national enrichment plant. Maybe some kind of multinational arrangement in the Middle East could, could uh, maybe it could be equipped with Iranian centrifuges. But uh, you know, the, the idea is not, we've just begun these discussions, but, but um, I just, I mean, what I'm saying is that, um, I guess it's a long answer, but you, you understand that uh, Japan does not need a Rokashio <laughs> to have a nuclear weapons option. Mm. Professor, if I may, uh, Japan was asked to return this uh, 300 kilograms of uh, plutonium, which it, it has borrowed from the US uh, during um, Nakasone, Reagan uh, era. Uh, that's a bomb grade, uh, 300 kilo of plutonium. Do you have any insight or information about as to why the um, United States suddenly now asking Japan to return it? I don't have inside information, but I, th but I think that uh, there was concerns about the security at mm -hmm. the Tokai facility. Uh, it, it, the, the fact that it's weapons grade means it's a little easier to make into a nuclear weapon, but any, any grade of plutonium you can make into a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, let's see if there's any anyone who wants to ask the first question. Then uh, uh, you want to go first? Okay, go ahead. Uh, 
Siegfried Needle Freelancer from Germany. Um, would it be possible for Japan to build, uh, without the knowledge of uh, IAEA, to build a nuclear weapon in kind of a secrecy? Uh, so it would be possible. And a question for Mr. Janberg about how is it, how long uh, in, in this kind of a uh, cask? How long is it possible to store in, a, in this cask? Uh, hmm. Okay. On on the first question, uh, I think it is possible. Uh, the the uh, even at Tokaimura, there was uncertainties in the uh, plutonium balance, uh, which were uh, enough for tens of nuclear weapons, and so. Uh, Within that uncertainty, if, if somebody had actually removed some of that plutonium and, and made it in, and could have made it into a bomb anywhere, so so uh, that's again the problem of the measurement uncertainties at at, 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 at reprocess and at mixed oxide fuel fabrication plants. There's also that same kind of uncertainty. Your first question: I, How long is a cask? It depends on the contents. The contents is a spent fuel element. There are research reactors where the fuel is just like this. No, no, he means how long will it last? No, that was the second question. <laughs> huh? so how big is a cask? How long is it? Okay. Here, by example, you see a cask together with the shock absorbers, which contains uh, spent fuel from the German fast breeder prototype KNK, which was sent for reprocessing to France. But France couldn't reprocess. We had to take it back. And the blue guy there is not, the blue boy is not Gainsborough, it's me. I had to supervise the whole thing. Which, which so one's the cask? Is it white one or the blue one? Blue the part. blue one. Blue, blue part blue. is the These cask. These are only shock absorbers okay. for transportation. Okay. So the casks range up to six meters length, because in between we can put, in between the six meters, a total fuel element. And this one is some uh, three meters long. Now the question, how long can you store? Uh, these casks are leak tight. There is no influence from outsides to the insides. Uh, the fuel is stored under helium. Helium, we know still from chemistry, uh, is not creating any corrosion, is not attacking the spent fuel, so it remains intact. For the time being, we have spent fuel in storage for uh, 38, 39 years. Uh, we have opened some costs, by example, in the United States of America and looked at the fuel, how it behaved perfectly. For the time being, we do not see any limit. And this cask here in particular contains fuel already canned and redocumented and prepared for direct final disposal within this cask in a salt mine at a depth of 900 meters under an outside pressure of 300 bars, if that would be the geological formation for final disposal licensed in Germany. That's John, one of these examples. Does this answer your question? So the lifetime, what is your suggestion of the lifetime of the past? How long will it take to grow through? Gr greater than yours and mine together. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, no, no, but the, the cask, <laughs> you know, in salt, there is, the salt doesn't contain any water. So it is not aggressing the cask itself. So we cannot establish uh, a life limit. But anyway, it depends on the final disposal medium. And if, as such, granite is chosen, we might have to take some additional protections as the Swedish do and the Finns, they put the cask into a copper overpack because copper in their environment is more resistant for thousands of years. In salt, we wouldn't have this problem, but in Germany, there is no decision yet, neither in Holland on this question. The, the, uh, the Swedish casks also then have a layer of clay, but I think the ultimate, the ultimate uh, barrier is the rocks around it, the, the low flow of water through the rocks. OK. You want to ask the second question? Go ahead. And, and. 
Yeah, please do, please do. And then Natalie, I... Even more than a year ago, two years ago, we had here a, a Japanese person for nuclear, nuclear fuel arrangement, but there are many such institutions in Japan. I don't recall the name, but he's a retired uh, Monju uh, Cho <laughs> head. And now he's Riji Cho. He, he, at that time, he was Riji Cho of this organization. And his argument for um, reprocessing and for keeping the fuel in underground um, storage, which you can reopen the storages, is that it would be uh, the fuel itself or the, this waste, which also this high radioactive waste after uh, reprocessing, uh, has so many uh, precious elements which we could use. Uh, we is Japan and uh, for future technology and I don't know what. So there's a future uh, in fuel and in waste, uh, radioactive waste. Can, can you explain this to us in, from your perspective? May I, too? Um, I am a breeder boy from the beginning. I started my nuclear career in breeder reactors in France. France is the most advanced country in this respect besides uh, Russia. At that time, we had exactly the idea the Japanese gentleman mentioned. We lived from the idea that plutonium is an asset. We can multiply its energy content by breeding in fast breeders. But then the breeders themselves became so expensive that they couldn't compete with light water reactors. And the plutonium was more and more expensive to be gained by reprocessing. So these years, the past three decades, uranium is cheap. And plutonium has become a burden. And a burden which costs a lot of money. And this money is not renewable. If you spend it on something which isn't worth it to be spent, it's lost. So that's the situation today. And for many years to come, we cannot make out of plutonium something which has a real commercial value. It has some value for those who are thinking perhaps 3,000 years ahead. But did you want to talk about this picture? No, no. It's <laughs> just. Uh, it's the guards at one of his facilities. <laughs> yeah, next to your place. The, the, uh, the only thing I would add is, is as, as, as Klaus said, plutonium was originally supposed to be make, make uh, nuclear power cheaper because, in effect, what pluton when you, you're making plutonium out of U-238, which is uh, 140 times more abundant in natural uranium than the chain reacting U-235. And so that, that was supposed to, going to reduce the cost of, uh, of fuel. The problem is uh, that at, at current prices, uh, the cost of uranium uh, is 0.2 yen per kilowatt hours. It's about 2% of the cost of a kilowatt hour. And reprocessing, the, obtaining the plutonium, uh, costs, we, we learned yesterday from METI, costs about a 1.5, 15 times more than the, than the value of the uranium that it would replace. That sounds very little. And so, I mean, that is reprocessing, recovering this valuable material, uh, would, I mean, because it's 15 times more expensive than buying the equivalent amount of, of uranium. Yeah. And so uh, it, it has just, um, we can't see a foreseeable time when, in fact, it would, it would actually be coming of positive value. Right now, it's of negative value, plutonium. Can you imagine my um, deception when I had to realize I'm not working on high-technology breeders, but I'm developing waste bins? You know, <laughs> what a decline in technology, <laughs> finally. But commercially viable. And that's the way it is. Plus, safe. Yeah. Unless you want to build bombs. Yeah. I don't. 
Okay, uh, Natalie, you, okay, go ahead. This will be the last question, I think. Okay. Yes, uh, with regard to waste uh, disposal uh, in deep underground, uh, would it be feasible with Japan because Japan has a lot of earthquakes? Yeah, um, we were just talking to a Japanese expert on that. He says the earthquakes are much less problem under deep underground than they are on the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you stay away from the faults, then you know you ha you need some tight rock, so you don't want to put the repository right on a fault. But uh, there's there's lots of places where there are not active faults. Okay, uh, you wanna you wanna do the last one? Okay. Did the Japanese government look for final ways for final disposal? And what what kind of uh, uh, ideas they have to do for, for final disposal? I think uh, one reason the uh, prime, former Prime Minister Koizumi is against uh, nuclear power is he said uh, so in Japan the final disposal is there is no solution for it. Yeah. Well, you know, in in uh, my view, uh, the hierarchy of concerns about nuclear power. Our nuclear weapons connection, possible, possible abuse of nuclear power to acquire nuclear weapons. Then comes reactor safety. And at the bottom of my list is radioactive waste disposal. But for the most of the public, it's the opposite. They think that the, uh, that the problem of getting rid of radioactive waste is the most important. Then they worry about reactor safety. And they don't think about the nuclear weapons connection at all. Uh, so, so the, um, you know, I think this is, I mean, this is, uh, I think we, this is what we have to, you have to discuss with the public, uh, the Japanese government has to discuss with the public, and they have to come to a common view on what are the greatest dangers. I already said that spent fuel on the surface is more dangerous than spent fuel deep underground. It's hard to, hard to understand uh, I think that maybe the uh, radioact the dangers of radioactive waste was exaggerated by the anti-nuclear movement. As a, you know, there was the sort of the stuff up the toilet theory, which is if you if you don't if you make it waste disposal impossible, finally the whole system will stop. Constipation, yeah, they call it. Yeah. Uh, and we know yeah, how. Yeah. The <laughs> and and but but that was. Uh, and I think then the nuclear, uh, you know, the breeder people adopted that theory, and they say, oh, you know, we, our breeder reactors will, will, uh, will deal with radioactive waste and make it less harmful. Uh, but so they both of them were conspiring to mislead, miseducate the public. And so now the public has to be, we, you know, we, well, it has to be engaged in a more serious way. Um, very last of all, uh, if Japan is to abandon its uh, uh, this uh, reprocessing, the um, all the spent fuel uh, that the power companies own now are now as registered as assets because they are fuel. But once uh, reprocessing uh, is you know stopped, uh, it will just be become a waste. And uh, it's one of the reasons that the power com or Japanese government cannot say we are we're going to stop doing re the reprocessing. This is a pure economics, but uh, do you have any suggestions or any 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 thoughts Frank, on that? It's yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, you went through it. Oh, it's politics. Yeah, yeah but uh, <laughs> we were forced to. You want it, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no, I, 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 economics is my not my expertise. Okay. But the the uh, I don't. I, it's hard to, for me to believe that they. I mean, what what kind of asset that they. You know that they how how much value they give spent fuel. It's a very it's, it's a actually, very, it's actually huge. It's, it's a huge, huge value. Yep. Yeah. Huge negative. Well, that, I would, <laughs> well, it will turn huge, huge, huge negative once uh, it's no longer fuel. But uh, yeah, but it, it's it's yeah. If it's yeah, it would be uh, if if you can educate. Maybe do you know what the number is? Uh, I don't I have an exact number, but it's actually a, a large sum of uh, money. Yeah. Right, man. Right, right. So basically. Well, okay, that's a new one on me. Right, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Basically, in Germany, 
uh, I also had to supervise the department where we uh, advised the utilities on how much money to put aside in order to cover the liability of the back end of the fuel cycle. Mm. And that was, in addition, uh, quite a big number. Mm. I'm unfortunately not entitled to tell you anything concrete, but if you look into the balance sheets of the Japanese utilities or of the French or German, you might eventually find a number or numbers equally for decommissioning. So look there, Thank but you. what you Thank said, you are on the right track, mm -hmm. definitely. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, this is, this is it uh, for the first conference, and uh, as a uh, as a custom, uh, as a token of appreciation, I'd like to present uh, to you the uh, honorary one year honorary membership. Uh, so oh. if you are uh, in Japan again, uh, please uh, come and have a drink with us. This, okay. Okay, this is actually this is for you. This is for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for coming to the press conference. Thank you very much.